Well, good morning. Welcome to Easttown. My name is Michael Dupin. My husband Clint and I started Easttown Church about four and a half years ago. And if this is your first time with you, I just want to say welcome. I'm so thankful for anyone that's joining us this morning. I want to say happy 4th of July to you. I hope you're having a great holiday weekend. If you are new with us, we would love to connect with you. You can simply check in with us by texting Easttown to 94000. Um, we would love to send you a small gift card in the mail. We'd love to stay in contact with you and let you know what's happening here at Easttown. In fact, something we have going on throughout the summer are the summer meetups here at Easttown. And these are just chances for us to build new friendships, to spend time in community, to have fun together throughout the summer. We just had a bike and brew this last Friday night, which was a blast. We have a few more coming up. We have a golf meetup. We have a hiking meetup. So you can just go to the Easttown app. If you've downloaded that, um, you can check out details on our social media or go to our events page on the website. But we would love for you to connect in this way. Now, throughout the summer, we have been in a series called Summer for the Soul. And we've been talking about the, these two questions, what nourishes my soul, what restores it, and also what are the things that kind of creep in and de deplete my soul? Where are the things that are kind of taking away from what my soul was intended to be? At the same time, today is what we call at Easttown our Love Local Action Day. And Love Local Action Day is just designed for each of us over this weekend or the next week to be intentional to love, care for, or invest in someone where we live, work, or play. Because we really believe neighborhoods and communities change when we are intentional to meet a need or bring joy to those that live every day right around us. Now, we would say at Easttown, we want this to be a lifestyle. The people of our community, we want us to be looking for ways to love local continually. But this weekend, with the focus on it, is one way of us kind of placing a reminder in our lives that how we care for those right where we are strategically placed matters to the world. In fact, I think it matters right now more than ever. So you might be thinking, how does Love Local Action Day connect to our souls? In fact, maybe the word action feels counterproductive to caring for your soul. I think often because the soul is mysterious, it's something we can't see, it lives deep within us, we may think that caring for our soul is very personal and something we are doing all for ourselves. And I would suggest this, that it might be easy to confuse soul care with self-care. I think they're often connected, but I also believe there is a distinct difference. Self-care is this key focus of our day today. I hear people say often, like, today is my self-care day, or I just need, really need a little self-care right now. I'm hearing of more and more companies that actually give time off when self-care is needed, which I think is amazing. Self-care is usually a focus on actions that care for the self in one of these three major areas, physical, mental, or emotional. And I would say it's a necessary focus if, as we've seen the ways that more and more people, kids, teenagers are battling mental health issues. And our focus for so long has been on success, achievement, and work until you drop. Self-care does seem to be the response to the long-held value of busyness and running from one thing to another as kind of a badge of honor or this sign of our importance. So I just want you to do something real quick as we talk about self-care. Take a second. If you were to think about a day for self-care in your life, what would it look like? If you're watching live on Sunday morning, I just want you to put it in the chat. Um, if not, tell someone next to you, someone that's watching with you or listening, or just think about it. For my husband, Clint, self-care would be something active. It would be outside. It would be building something, doing something very physical. I even feel my face kind of contorting as I say that. It's like, for me, all of that is so far from self-care. Anything that makes me feel like I have to accomplish something is the furthest thing from self-care for me. I want to stay in my comfy clothes, maybe my t-shirt that says it's too people-y outside. I usually want to stay at home, sleep, sleep in, read a book, do no laundry, do no dishes for sure. Or I want to go to Pacific Grove. I want to cr climb the rocks a little, look at the tide pools, and then sit by the water with a book 
or with my family. But soul care, I would argue, is different. Soul care is a focus on actions that connect us to the heart of our creator in the depth of our being. Soul care puts us in a place of slowing down, of listening to the voice of God to help clean out the areas that have become distorted, distracted from who we were created to be. And soul care then is to strengthen and replenish the places that realign us to the one whose image we were created in. And here's what I believe self-care can be done on your own. It can be done for yourself, but true soul care can only be done by the Holy Spirit. So while self-care may be a part of or an outcome of this realignment when it comes to soul care, to who we were designed to be, one another care is also an outcome. And here's what I mean by that. All throughout scripture, we are reminded that right along with the importance of loving God is loving our neighbor. This is how we were created. This is how we were designed. And we see scripture all throughout and over and over that tells us exactly how God designed us to do that, how we are to treat one another, care for one another, love one another, honor one another, carry one another's burdens, live in harmony with one another, build up one another, forgive one another. So if we think about the focus just as much on loving God as loving my neighbor, this is the first commandment. He says, this is the second. Who exactly is my neighbor? It's anyone I come in contact with, those around the areas in which I'm strategically placed. At Easttown, we place a specific focus on those right around you where you live, work, and play. Why? Because those are the places that we have both the greatest possibility and the greatest responsibility for impact. These are the places in which we have the potential to remain in relationship, to build upon relationship, and to strengthen relationship. We have repeated proximity. It doesn't mean the places that we may serve as a one-time event don't matter. But think about the potential for God's love to be experienced when we care for someone over time when we invest in relationship, when we allow his love to cover over the hard parts of that relationship and we stay in it with people. Because these one another directives are not just for the people in our lives that are easy to love. They are for the people who look different than me, who grew up differently, who vote differently, believe differently. Bob Goff is one of my favorite authors and he says in his book, Everybody Always, If I'm only willing to love the people who are nice to me, the ones who see things the way I do and avoid all the rest, he says it's like reading every other page of the Bible and thinking I know what it says. A quick side note, if you need to be inspired about how little intentional acts of love to your neighbors can literally change someone's life, can change a neighborhood, I would encourage you to read one of Bob Goff's books, either Love Does or Everybody Always. In fact, there's a children's version of Everybody Always that we read often in our family. So this is where we're going to focus today. When we allow God to replenish our soul and restore us back to who we were created to be, what do we get to experience as an overflow? As we prepared for Love Local Action Day, we actually gave you some questions to consider. Where do you see a need when you look around at these spaces where you live, work, and play? Where can you bring joy? Where is there an opening in a relationship? And as you consider these, what is God bringing to your mind? We also gave you this scripture that I love, which is so practical in the message version. It says this, make sure you don't take things for granted and go slack in working for the common good. Share what you have with others. God takes particular pleasure in acts of worship, a different kind of sacrifice that takes place in kitchen and workplace and on the streets. This is in Hebrews 13, 16. Just think about it. Like God takes pleasure in what happens in my kitchen, in my workspace, as I walk down the street. Yes, God takes pleasure in the sacrifice I make for others that he has placed in the everyday spaces of my life. I think about my kitchen growing up 
in my family of origin, it was used over and over and over to serve others, to invite others in. Our family didn't have a ton to give away, but what we did have, my parents used for the good of others. This was modeled to me, and it was modeled to them by my grandparents. Even more than the kitchen always being open at my grandparents, the front door was always open always unlocked. Anyone could walk right in, sit down in the kitchen, and along with food, be given a space to be known and loved. We could bring anyone along with us when we went to my grandparents' house. So I just think about that in light of this, as we hold this as such a high value at Easttown, deeply believing these simple acts of love show the love and goodness of God we have to consider a few questions. And here's what I wanna encourage you with. Maybe you write these two questions down and you pray over them in the next few days. The first question is this, do I really believe my actions with those around me matters? Do I believe the way I care for those right around me could really make a difference? Because I think this, to many of us, Love Local Action Day probably sounds like a great idea. We might even love the Love Local shirt and wear it. But we have to ask ourselves, am I really willing to rearrange my schedule, my plans, my routine, because I see myself as a carrier of the love of Jesus to those around me? So as we consider those two questions, as you think about that, just hold those questions. I want you to look at a scripture that for a lot of us, we might be familiar with. This story, um, even if you're not familiar with the Bible, you may have heard about, but it's the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus takes five, five loaves of bread and two fish to feed these thousands. And in the end, the crazy thing is there are still leftovers. I believe what we read in this story just might change the way we see our ability to make a difference. So we're reading today in the book of Matthew. This is one of the four gospels in the New Testament. And the four gospels are the books that tell the good news of Jesus. And so we're gonna pick it up here in Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. And just so you have a little background, this is right after John the Baptist, who was the cousin of Jesus and was proclaiming the coming of Jesus, was just killed. And so Jesus hears this news and is going away to be by himself. And so in verse 13, it says this, As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So the first thing we see before we move on is the compassion of Jesus. Maybe you're a person that questions whether God really cares or God really sees what's going on in your life. And as we seek to allow the Holy Spirit to replenish our souls this summer, This is a beautiful picture of the compassion that Jesus has for you, whatever you're facing right now, and the desire, the desire that he has to bring healing to that area. But it's also a picture of the compassion we want to model after. Compassion actually means to suffer with, that we do not let people around us suffer alone. And we see that his compassion moves him to this active engagement to heal people, to provide for their needs. And I just wanna pause for a moment. As I was reading through this and studying and praying this week, I just had this thought that at the same time, the news of Jesus and his compassion and his ability to heal people is spreading all around the land. The religious leaders of this day and age, the people that they would know, those are the ones that lead in faith and religion are known for their deep knowledge, for their judgment of others, for their superiority. So this new rabbi or teacher that comes on the scene, which is what Jesus was known as at the time, was so different, was so remarkable. One who was not standing in judgment of others, but was getting involved in the pain and brokenness of people's lives 
was drawing person after person to him. Think about today. Think about the divide we are experiencing in our world. It feels like one divide after another. The obsession that people seem to feel and you can experience when you're on social media for sure to win, to be right, to judge others, it's all around us to gloat, even by those that would say they are Christians. And maybe the hard part is that often it's especially by those So think about how remarkable it is, how remarkable it would be for someone who has been judged or shamed or hurt by other Christians to see a completely different picture. Think about what it would mean for someone to go out of their way to have compassion, to listen, to see them, to suffer with and to step into the painful places of their lives. We talked about this a lot in the first couple of years of East Town, but we just talked about this idea that sometimes our role might be to redefine what people think about the church and what people think about who God is in their lives. So as we continue on in the scripture, we see in verse 15, it says, that evening the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the, cl- send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. I wonder if we often have this same thought process. When we look around at our neighbors, at our coworkers, the people that are in our social cir- circles, on your kids' sports teams, whatever it might be, and we think, they're good. They're capable. They can take care of themselves. Don't we all like to present this to others, that we're good, we're capable, we can take care of ourselves. But Jesus is not unclear in his expectations as he responds to how the disciples are viewing the situation. Nope. He says, you feed them. You take care of their needs. And then in verse 17, the disciples respond like this. They say, but we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Again, do we have a similar response, similar thought pattern? I do often. I don't have what they need. I can't take care of what's going on in their life. What do I really have to offer? Nothing I do is going to make that big of a difference in my neighbor's life, much less in my neighborhood or in my city. But here's what I love here. Jesus doesn't go into a parable here. These are the stories that he would often tell. He doesn't try to teach the disciples through his words. He demonstrates what is real and true when we live a life with him through his actions. So in verse 18, after the disciples say, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, like, don't you get this, Jesus? And there's 5,000, just 5,000 men. That's not even counting the women and children that were there. In verse 18, Jesus responds, bring them here, he said. Basically, bring me what you have, the five loaves of bread and two fish. And then in 19, verse 19, he says, then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. In this story, what is Jesus demonstrating here to the disciples that he wants us to see today? The first thing I see here is that God is always ready to respond to our needs, even the most very basic physical needs, and there is power when others bring our needs before God. Now, the disciples may not have known that. The disciples brought the need to Jesus thinking like, hey, I'm going to make you aware they need to eat, but they can go do it on their own. He just had a very different plan of how that need would be met. The disciples are ready to outsource or leave the people on their own with the need, but Jesus quickly said, nope, you meet the need. Of course, the disciples have to think he's crazy. How can they ever begin to have what is needed to feed 5,000 
plus? How can we ever have what is needed to heal the broken places in our world? to meet the needs of those around us who may not even let us into their lives very easily, right? Because again, we all want to portray, we're good. We got this. How could we ever have what is needed to show Jesus to those who believe or act so differently than we do? We see the disciples' response. It is, but we only. Just take a moment when it comes to loving others around us, in order that every person could experience the tangible love of Jesus, think about how many different ways you might say, I might say, but I only. But here's what's beautiful about this picture is Jesus doesn't shame the disciples. He takes their, but we only excuse and says, it's okay, bring it here. In other words, I can see how you feel that way, but let me show you what happens when you give the little you have to me to be used the way I created it to be used. So there are four things I want to pull out of the scripture and show you that we see Jesus do. The first one is this. He takes it. When we offer it to him, he takes it. He doesn't look down on it. He doesn't think, wow, what little you have. He takes it. He receives it, knowing that when you offer it, something beautiful can happen. Something so far beyond what you could imagine can happen. Something so far beyond what you could ever make happen on your own, no matter how hard you try. The disciples on their own could never have fed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. The second thing we see is he blesses it. He takes what we have offered and what we have acknowledged we have to give, no matter how small in comparison to what the need is that we might see around us, and he blesses it. In his blessing, he's taking what we have to offer from something ordinary, something maybe small, to something extraordinary. He is taking what we think is so small in our hands and just saying, Watch, watch how I will use this to bring flourishing to those around you. I just want us to take a moment and think about some of the actions taking place by people in our community for Love Local Action Day. Pies being baked and delivered to neighbors, taking a few coworkers to lunch, water balloon parties for neighborhood kids, riding bikes around the block to meet some maybe new to you neighbors, porch drop-offs with a small gift and a note of encouragement or appreciation. We may wonder what impact these really have, but when placed in the hands of God because he blesses it, because he honors what we give him, the impact will be far greater than what we have or could imagine in our own minds. What if this simple connection that you are intentional to make creates a way forward for a deepening relationship? where someone may down the road let you into the pain they are walking through. It may create a way for someone to see you care, for someone to know your house is open, for someone to know they are simply not alone. We cannot forget that no matter how small, he blesses it. And then the third thing we see him do is he breaks it. This might be the hardest part. I think of the breaking here as synonymous with sacrifice. What we have to be used in the lives of others will require sacrifice, a willingness to take the focus off of self and our patterns and routines, off of our comfortability to stop and care and actually see those around us. In fact, we see this significance as Jesus takes the bread and breaks it. We see the significance all throughout scripture of the breaking of bread. We see over and over the power of this. At the Last Supper, when Jesus ate with the disciples, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. He instructed them to continue to do this together as a reminder of the new covenant, the restored relationship that we have with God and the new life that comes because of his brokenness. 
his sacrifice for us on the cross. The breaking of bread is a symbol of the sacrifice that Jesus made so that we could be made whole. The breaking of bread is a symbol for his body that was physically broken so that we could be connected back to our creator. Then the breaking of bread together around the table in the early church and still to this day, we practice the city town. In fact, we just did last Sunday is a reminder, not only of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, but it's a reminder that we are not alone. If you're alone, there's no reason to break this bread. But we break bread because it is shared. We're not meant to live this life alone and to only look out for our own needs, but we're meant to open our tables and care for the needs of one another. Jim Branch is the author of one of my favorite devotionals. It's called The Blue Book, and he says this, It seems in Jesus' economy, we can't be multiplied enough to be given. We can only be broken enough to be given. It is in the breaking that the abundance comes. It is in the breaking that the multiplying occurs, just as it will be for each of us if we really want to have something of depth and substance to give to those around us. It will usually involve some sort of breaking. Because somehow in the brokenness, it has stopped being about us and our ability to multiply ourselves And it has begun being about God and his ability to multiply our little loaves and little fish with his strong and tender hands. This is hard. None of us really wants to be broken. There is often discomfort, maybe even fear when we give up to what we're holding so tightly to, trying to take care of ourselves. And we say we're willing to be broken for others. We're willing to sacrifice. But this also has to come from a place of trust. Just like Jesus is taking action to respond to the needs of the crowd, in the process, the disciples are fed and have baskets left over. They have far more than they started with. Do we trust God to care for us in our brokenness as we care for others in their brokenness? The last thing we see is that he uses it. Look at the crowd that was fed. Imagine how the crowd feels seeing this miracle taking place before their eyes. Imagine how the faith of the disciples grew when they were ready to send people away to care for themselves. But because they gave what they had to God, look how he used it. I just think about back in the scripture, it actually says that he gave the bread to the disciples to distribute it. It's like God could take care of the needs of the world on his own. He doesn't need us, but it's a privilege we have for God to use us to distribute his love, his provision to the people around us. And our faith grows in those moments. Our soul is restored in those moments because that's how we were created to live. Jim Branch again says this. He says, You give them something to eat, Jesus is saying, because I gave you something that only you can give. First give it to me, and then I will give it back to you in abundance. Only then will you be able to give it to them, whoever your them may be. At Easttown, we would say people where you live, work, and play. And in the giving of it to them, you will find that there is enough to feed you as well. So why the urgency, the focus on this? Why does this matter so much at Easttown? I look at the scripture in Isaiah 45, 6. It says, So that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. The deepest longings inside of me, inside of you, are only fully met by Jesus. There's no full healing, full wholeness, love, grace, justice apart from Jesus. We want people to see through us as individuals, through our community placed here in the East Bay, that God is good that in spite of what they might see from people, in spite of what they might have made up in their own minds, God loves them deeply. God has compassion and God is at work in their lives. 
This last week, I spoke with a woman who reached out for prayer, and I listened to the immense loss that she has experienced over the last five years. She has had some suicidal thoughts before. She is currently battling depression. And as I just began to ask her questions about relationships or people in her life or a support system, I learned that she is literally alone. Can you imagine what would happen if just one person living near her or working beside her was intentional to connect with her? If someone took her to lunch or invited her into their kitchen or just listened to the pain that she walked through. We care for our souls as we live a with God life, as our souls are deeply connected to the one who created them. And as we care for the soul, living a with God life, out of that flows a like God life a heart for the things that God cares for, eyes that see the way God sees, a person, us, that responds to others in the world around us the way Jesus did. I believe great things can happen just if a fraction of us would say, I'm committed that the way we love people where we live, work, and play is going to be a part of my lifestyle. I know that might feel like a tall challenge at times, but I want to remember that when we give it to God, He uses it in ways that we could never imagine. So as we close, I want to read the scripture over you. I want you maybe even to pray this prayer every day this week to remind yourself the power that is available when we give God what we have and step out in faith on behalf of others. So just close your eyes. Maybe you open your hand just as a symbol that you want to be open and give God what you have, no matter how small you may think it is. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21 says this, and I just want to pray this over you remind you, God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the Messiah in Jesus. Glory down all the generations. Glory through all millennia. Amen. So all throughout the summer, we are focusing on one spiritual discipline a month. And that is just a way that we are disciplined and intentional to connect with our creator. And so for the month of June, it was the prayer of examine that we've been walking through. July, our spiritual discipline will actually be rest. I know it's July 3rd. But we're going to hold off on rest until next Sunday. I want you to continue with the prayer of examine. And this is just a simple way to be intentional at the end of the day to reflect back. As you reflect back on your day and all that has happened, you ask God to enter in, to show you spaces maybe that you pulled away from God, that you drew near to God. And so we kind of do that through some intentional questions. And so these are the questions that I want you to ask this week. It's similar to the questions that we asked you to process going into Love Local Action Day. So think about your day at the end of the day. Where did I see a need is question number one. Maybe you journal that. Maybe you just write that down, jot it down in your phone. The second question is, where did I notice someone? Where did God maybe stir in me something for someone? At any time in my day today, When I noticed someone or saw a need, did I respond with, but I only, or they can take care of themselves. And the last question is, what do I have that I could give to God so he could bless it, break it, and use it? And then I want you to respond. This is what Love Local Action Day is all about. This is what Love Local is, that when we see a need, when God brings someone to mind, that we would respond. I believe we will see incredible things happen. If you ever want to share an idea 
a way that you see God working as you step out in this, I would love to hear your stories. You can email me, michael at easttown.church. You could post just how your neighbors or people in your workplace are building a relationship and tag it, hashtag love local action day if you want to post anything, but we would love to hear stories. Now, as we close, I just want to remind you, we would love for you to get further connected at Easttown. Our meetups this summer are a great way to do that. You can go on our app or website and get more information. I also want to say this. There are so many of you that are being generous here at Easttown that you know the mission God has called us to matters. And so you're supporting that with your finances. And I just want to say thank you. If you haven't stepped into that journey yet, I would just encourage you to do that, to live generously. This is another thing that God blesses. He blesses our finances when we give it to him and say, I want it to be used for your good to advance your kingdom. If you're not a reoccurring giver yet, we would encourage you to do that as well. So we will have a QR code here on the screen. You can just scan that. You can always go to our website and begin your generosity journey. But we are so thankful for people that partner with us to have the greatest impact that we can have here in the East Bay. I just want to thank you for joining us today. We will be back in person at Iron Horse Middle School at 10 a.m. next Sunday. If you have not visited us in person yet and you are in the area, I would encourage you to join us. We are continuing Summer for the Soul. We have an incredible speaker I cannot wait to hear. He is one of our church planting partners. He is down in the South Bay. So I just want to encourage you to be there. We are starting a brand new spiritual discipline for the month, and it is rest. And so be there, be a part of it. Um, We will also post that message the following Monday at noon. You will be able to see what happens in person at Easttown. Have a great week. See you soon.